My name is Moria Amit, and I am the uh, manager of the Center for Jewish History's Akron and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute. I want to welcome you all to Family History Today, the Center's monthly series of genealogy-themed public programs. I'd like to thank the Leo Beck Institute and Yeshiva University Museum for co-sponsoring this program. And uh, I would also like to give a special shout out to their members, as well as to the members of the Yekes uh, Facebook group who are in the audience tonight, uh, actually this afternoon, rather. Um, one second. Okay. Uh, okay. So just a little bit about the center before I continue, uh, we continue on to the rest of the program. The center provides a collaborative home for five in-house partner organizations that together form the largest archive on the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. In addition, the center houses the Genealogy Institute, where I am based, and the Institute strives to connect researchers to the wealth of genealogy resources at the center and to make family history more accessible to people of all ages, abilities, and levels of experience, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. At the Institute, you will enjoy free access to genealogy databases with our librarians and experienced volunteers on hand to provide guidance. And you don't need to make an appointment. You can visit us uh, anytime, Monday through Thursday, 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. If you're unable to visit us in person, you may email us at gi at cjh.org to ask for advice on your genealogy questions or to schedule a free 45 minute Zoom consultation. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, please send us your questions and comments anytime during this program by using the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Please note, however, that my guest speakers will only answer your questions during the panel discussion after the final presentation. If you'd like to view the captions for this program, click on the closed caption or CC button on the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitles. And lastly, this program will be recorded. It's being recorded right now. Uh, you'll receive an email with the link to watch the recording in about two to three weeks. So I just wanna give a quick uh, overview of the timeline for today's program uh, because it does have a, a number of different parts. So first I will introduce all three of my esteemed colleagues on today's panel. Then I will turn it over to each of them to present on their area of expertise vis-a-vis -vis Wimples. And I will present on how to use the center's online catalog to search for and access relevant materials in our partner collections. And finally, I'll moderate what I expect will be a lively panel discussion based on selected questions from the audience and my own questions. And so with that, I would like to start introducing the speakers. And I just wanna point out that I am going to introduce uh, all three of them at the top of the program. Uh, and uh, therefore they will not be uh, introduced individually before each of them presents. Okay, so starting with our first presenter, Dr. Felicitas Hyman Yelenek works as a freelance curator internationally and as a scholar in Vienna. Dr. Hyman Yelenek primarily focuses on Jewish cultural history, museology, and provenance history in her work and publications. She has served as a guest lecturer at universities of Vienna, Heidelberg, Zurich, and Kassel, representing these fields. Dr. Hyman Yelenek also leads the curatorial education program of the Association of European Jewish Museums and is a member of numerous academic advisory boards. Moving on to our second panelist, Bonnie Dara Michaels. She is the collections curator of Yeshiva University Museum and has been with the museum since 1985. Michaels both manages the museum's collection and curates some of the museum's ex exhibitions, including uncommon threads, clothing, and textiles from the Yeshiva University Museum collection. In addition to her work on museum publications, such as Ashkenaz, The German Jewish Heritage, published in 1988, The Sephardic Journey, published in 92, and Theodor Herzl, If You Will, if you will It Is Not a Dream, published in 97, 
She co-authored The Art of Passover, published in 94, with Gabriel Goldstein. Michaels has presented papers at the Council of American Jewish Museums and Costume Society of America Symposia, and has led numerous programs, virtual and in-person, on collection items. And last but not least, Karen S. Franklin is the Director of Family Research at the Leo Beck Institute and the Consulting Director of the Peter and Mary Jewish uh, Genealogy Calico Center at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living museum, uh, sorry, living memorial to the Holocaust. Karen has served as the president of the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies, or IAJGS, uh, chair of the Council of American Jewish Museums, chair of the uh, Memorial Museums Committee of the International Council of Museums, and as co-chair of the Board of Governors of JewishGen.org. She is a recipient of the IAJGS Lifetime Achievement Award. And one more thing I would like uh, to do before we jump into today's presentations, um, I would like to uh, invite you uh, to join me in observing a moment of silence in remembrance of the victims of Hamas's horrific attacks in Israel on October 7th and in support of everyone who has been personally affected by this tragedy. Um, so I will just be turning off my video for about 30 seconds and I welcome you again to join me in reflection. Okay, uh, I hope this was a meaningful pause for all of you, um, as it was for me. So with that, I would like to um, bring back, bring, or, or I should say, bring on uh, the first of our panelists. Uh, Felicitas, are you ready? Hi. Hi. I'm going to uh, turn off my camera and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for this kind invitation um, to be part of this event, this um, for you afternoon, for me uh, in Vienna later evening, actually. I hope this um, works now as it should. And does it? Uh, it was on for a second, but now I don't see it. Okay, I try it again. Now it's on. It's on? Is it on? Yes, it's on. I can see it. Great. Um, so, um, thank you again um yeah um circumcision of boys has existed for thousands of years all over the world and this is only really a very very short overview and introduction into the uh, broad field of wimples statistics speak of a third of the world's cur current male population being circumcised for various reasons. In Jewish tradition, the ritual circumcision of the foreskin of the male, or of the male organ, the bris milah, confirms the relationship with God and marks the bond with and integration into Judaism. Looking for these depictions of the brit milah ceremony, we find one of the earliest images 
in the German Regensburg Pentateuch from around 1300. We see women bringing the baby boy into an architectonical structure, which may well represent a synagogue. The infant sits on a textile in the arms of the godmother before it is circumcised on the lap of the godfather, also placed on a piece of cloth. Is this cloth a so-called wimple? And since when does it exist? The wimple or mappa of the German speaking community was and is intended for several purposes. It was handed over by the child's father in the synagogue when the boy between the ages of one and three attended attends the synagogue for the first time. This handing over of the mappa stands for joining in with the community and binding oneself to the Torah. This action of handing over the wimple by father and son is known as carrying the mappa to school, die Mappe Schule tragen. The mappa later plays a role in ceremonies of other festivals in the young Jew's life. For example, the Torah of his bar mitzvah is wrapped in the wimple, and at his wedding it is needed by wrapping the Torah that is read on the Shabbat before the wedding, or decorating the chuppah, the wedding canopy. Over time, hundreds of Torah wimples were collected in the cupboard of a synagogue congregation. This collection had a certain practical significance as a kind of a birth register for the boys. As Torah wimples come into direct contact with the holiness of the Torah, they cannot simply be thrown away, but were and are deposited in the Gniza of the congregation concerned. The oldest wimple, and that is what we see in front of us, the oldest wimples we physically have today stem from the second half of the 16th century. This one was found in the Geniza of Westheim, which is in Franconia, and dates from uh, 1590. The approximately three meter long wimple is made from the classic wrapping band of the wrapping child, which has been documented already as early as in Crete around 2000 before Christ. We see here the rapid child, which is called in German Wickelkind, on this southern German wimple from 1715. It is part of the Feuchtwanger collection in the Israel Museum, which gives the opportunity to state that Nomi Feuchtwanger Sarig wrote a most important article on wimples. She combed Jewish sources like the Minhagei Maharil from the 15th century to trace the origin of the wimple as well as other sources like the Ganz Jüdische Glaub by apostate Antonius Margarita, printed in Augsburg in 1530, which mentioned the wimple only in an updated version from 1705. Another convert to Christianity, Johann Wilhelm Christiani, described in 1732, and I quote, the vestments for the Torah comprise, firstly, a swathing cloth, a textile of delicate linen, two handbreadths wide and spanning five cubits in length. This red garners an even greater esteem amidst adherents of the Judaic faith and enthusiasts of Hebraic antiquities. Owing to its unique genesis, it takes its form from the swaddling cloth which once cradled a circumcised infant with the very blood of that sacred rite staining its fibers, subsequently fashioned and adroitly stitched together, emblazoned with Hebrew script 
wrought in grand fractal characters, it bears naught but the date and months of the infant's nativity, accompanied by the child's appellation and that of his progenitor. Noteworthily within Jewish tradition, this swathling textile garners the status of a mitzvah, an enactment of rabbinic mandate when it is crafted by an unsolid maiden or a bride. Nothing uh, is known about this by other authors. In contradiction to the diaper Christiani mentions, you see here in a Moel book from the Baroque era, the long wickel band of the wickel kind in which it was threaded. I would like to show a wimble close to the length, although I know that Bonidara will present a series of complete binders with the different sections, just because it is a very special wimple. What you read here is the name Jacob, son of Israel, and it goes on. I'm sorry, you can read it here and here and here. And here you see, it is a painted one, by the way. Um, it's decorated with birds, as you can see here, and with uh, cornucopias. Um, and here you have the mazal, which is a, a, a craft, a scorpion, which is not really a professional illustration as you uh, as you can easily see, uh, see and which might point to the fact that this that the, this decoration, this illustration was not uh, made by the same hand as the rest of the wimple, which uh, looks very professional. Um, and look at the beautiful, beautiful fish, for example, here, um, the uh, birds again, the beautiful carp, uh, which is the uh, higher end of the lamet, of the letter lamet. Um, see it here, a bit bigger. Um, the Torah, the angel blowing for the Torah. And here, again, not from the professional hand, maybe the couple under the chuppah with the rabbi, uh, and the couple in quite a fancy costume. This is the end of the wimple. Um, and it is uh, the special because this is the wimple of uh, Israel Jakobson, born on the 17th of October, 1768 in Halberstadt, the founder of the German reform movement was the famous Jakobson School the first simultaneous school in Germany and the Jakobson Temple uh, in Zesen and this winter <coughs> is today in the collection of the Historical Museum of uh, Braunschweig. In general, a wimper can, can be just to tell you a few details about the manufacturing. It can be embroidered, uh, like you see it here. It can be painted, as we saw on the <coughs> winter for Israel Jakobson. It can be printed. This is a typical print from the Augsburg region. Um, or it can be stenciled, which is, I mean, um, also a very fancy uh, way of uh, production. The decoration uh, of the wimple can refer to the boy's name. For example, here it is the name Lamer, and it is alluded to by a little lamb, if you see it. It also is not too, I mean, professional. And again, hints to the fact that a wimple may have been uh, made, produced by different hands. 
Um, it may refer, uh, as in this wimple, to the village in which a boy was born, like here, uh, where it says under these little houses, Isingerode, which is also in the area of uh, Halberstadt in uh, northern Germany, northeast Germany. And it may bear the maker's name, as you see it here, uh, Wolf Ben Lemil, and Nota Bene, not a woman, as uh, we might uh, assume. You can read from a wimple also that the wish for good deeds uh, may be the wish that the boy in the far future will still be reading Torah and Talmud whilst needing glasses. So it is also the wish that he uh, will uh, arrive uh, an old age. And you can read from a wimple like here that the Hebrew name Kalman Bar Yaakov uh, in this case under, undergoes acculturation or even Germanization as Karl with the last name Tannenwald. So Kalman became Karl was Germanized, uh, and his family name is Tannenwald or was Tannenwald. And a wimple can also demonstrate, like here, very, very openly, loyalty, if not patriotism, with the tricolore in this case in Alsace, to show the affiliation, the loyalty to France, and not the affiliation with Germany. Last but not least, a wimper can finally tell the whole story uh, of the transition of this right, of this minhag of the wimper, which stems from actually Southern Germany, uh, spread to all Germany, spread to Alsace and what is today Switzerland spread to the Czech lands and spread even to Denmark. And then, I mean, the, uh, with, as such, a wimple is also always an, <coughs> a cultural object of migration, a migratory object. Like here, uh, this Minhag was brought from Germany to the United, United States. So it tells this migratory story of a Minhag too. And it tells here the whole story of the boy, the circumcised boy being brought up to become, as you can read here on his briefcase, a master of advanced studies, a certified public accountant, uh, and last, not, last but not least, a good American Jew. With this, I thank you for your patience and look forward to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Felicitas. I, I really appreciate that overview. Uh, of the history and the scope of Wimples. And I look forward to uh, hearing some more details about Wimples uh, and how they're uh, made and decorated from our next speaker. Uh, Bonnie Dara, are you ready? Yes, one moment. Can you see my screen? I can. Very good. In 2022, Yeshiva University Museum received an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant 
to collaborate with the Center for Jewish History, in which we are located, to digitize 61 wimples in the museum's collection, edit entries in the museum's database, enhance the metadata in the Center's digital asset management program, and to make the images available to the public in the Center's online database. The project goal was threefold, a project to digitize and make all of our holdings available online, to enable the general public, researchers, and students to have safe, easy access to this treasure trove of material culture and historic and genealogical information, and to protect the wimples which are fragile. The wimples in our collection date from the 17th to the mid 20th century. They are very long. One in the collection measures over 18 feet. There is no surface large enough in this building to display these textiles should a researcher wish to examine them. Handling can put the paint at risk of flaking and the embroidery at risk of catching and pulling. Digitization is the ideal way to enable the wimples to be shared in their entirety. The museum's collection of wimples comes from several sources, both public and private. The earliest collection of wimples was donated to Yeshiva University by Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, which I will refer to as JCR. This organization was established in Germany in 1947 to collect and redistribute Jewish cultural property for which owners could not be found. Items were given to libraries, museums, and universities, mostly in the United States, Israel, and Britain. Yeshiva University received a number of items from Jewish cultural reconstruction and turned them over to the museum after it was founded in 1973. Here you see a memo from Hannah Arendt, who was executive secretary of JCR, listing organizations that received material. The second institutional donor to our collection was Congregation Shari Hatikva, of Washington Heights. This is a community in which many German Jewish immigrants settled both before and after World War II. The museum received a total of 41 wimples from these two sources, and these wimples date from 1816 to 1951. Collectors, including the Jesselson family and Max Stern, donated a further six wimples, and the museum received an additional 14 from individual families. Since the binders are long and fragile, one of the museum's textile team, Gail Alderman, who you see at left, worked with the center's Jennifer Rodewald, creative and digital services manager to digitize the binders. They are stored rolled and you can see a bit on the right end of the wimble. And the, yes, it is upside down to Gail, but it is not upside down to the camera. Each wimble had to be unrolled a section at a time, photographed and re-rolled. The yellow post-its helped them keep track of which section they had done. The digital sections were then stitched together so that each wimple can be examined as a whole and in detail. This shows you an entire wimple. It is the oldest in our collection dating to 1643. It was made for the son of Meshulam Shalad. Unfortunately, this section with the boy's name has been lost. Now, under where it says Center for Jewish History, there 
appear tabs that you can click on to make the binder smaller, enlarge the details. Uh, sorry, to make the binder larger, enlarge the details, or smaller so that you can go back and look at more of the binder at one time. This shows you the beginning of the binder. Letters forming the words are outlined in thread and then filled with decorative motifs. Some from the shapes of birds or some form the shapes of birds or animals, a popular decorative treatment in medieval manuscripts known as zoomorphic letters. Here you see a 1722 wimple made for Moshe, the son of Shimon Wolf Oppenheim. The embroidery consists of open letters forming the text. These are filled with flowers and other decorative elements, including a running dog that's rather cute and you have to go find it. Since the name of the boy for whom it was made was Moses, at your right, the binder begins with the figure of Moses holding the tablets. It continues to show us some charming townscapes, but also, as frequently happens, some illustrations of the text itself. Here we see a man holding the Torah, which follows the wish that the boy grow to learn Torah, and a man and wife under the chuppah, the marriage canopy. This painted example is one that we acquired from Jewish cultural reconstruction. It was made in 1930 for Naftali, or Hans Werner Hirsch, the son of Shmuel. It gives us a different view of the contemporary world. The decorative motifs consist of illustrations from fairy tales, starting with the figures of a boy and girl, probably Hansel and Gretel, and Little Red Riding Hood meeting the wolf. There are also toys, including this wheeled soldier riding on a horse. Farther on, we have a flowering candelabrum decorating the wish that the boy learn Torah and alluding to the Torah as the tree of life. Though there is also a depiction of an open Torah. The letters of the word chuppah flank another candelabrum and form the chuppah with flowers on the top. I have not been able to understand why this copy grinder appears under the word good deeds. The boy was a little young for coffee. The last image on this binder perhaps shows what the parents hoped he would grow up to look like. The final wimple I will share with you today was acquired from Congregation Shari Hatikva and was made for Shmuel, Michael Sam Reinheimer, the son of Jacob in 1949. In this case, we know the painter, Reverend Ruben Ashvega. He was a cantor, teacher, and Moel, as well as an artist. Born in Germany, he attended the Jewish school taught by his father. Graduating from the Jewish Teachers Seminary in Würzburg in 1911, he served for 25 years as the chief cantor of a Würzburg congregation. And by the way, the last binder that Felicitas just showed you was also decorated by this Reverend Ishvega. He resumed his cantorial career when he arrived in New York in 1940. The decoration on this wimple consists of religious and secular motifs, as well as illustrations of the text itself. The former include a Passover Seder plate surrounded by four cups of wine, 
the five books of Torah, a lulav and etrog, a Shabbat table, and another set for Havdalah. A half grapefruit topped with a maraschino cherry reminds us of the food customs of yesteryear. The text is illustrated with a dressed Torah, a bride and groom under the marriage canopy, a charity container for good deeds. The furniture that you see may be intended to represent the family's Washington Heights furniture shop or perhaps their living room and their car. Thank you for joining us today, and I return the program to Moria. Thank you so much, Bonnie Dara. Uh, those were, uh, again, lovely examples of this tradition, um, and I greatly appreciate your uh, contribution of uh, information about the uh, digitization project that you and your team have undertaken to, uh, so that people, all of, all of you watching today and people around the world can have access to, uh, to see these uh, beautiful objects wherever you are in the world. Um, all right, with that, uh, Karen, are you ready? I hope so. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, here we go again. Uh, forgive me, it's not so simple to do this. So I, my apologies, it should be there. Um, give me one moment. Uh, I'm so sorry, hold on one sec. going to ask my colleague Frank Mecklenburg to help me with this. This is a, a new problem uh, with my computer that I haven't had before. Um, while I'm working on it, let me just tell you um, a little bit about what I will be talking today when I figure out how to do this. Uh, first is uh, taking a look at wimples from three ways. One, if you have a wimple from your family and you'd like to know more about it and interpret it. The second is if you're looking for a wimple uh, that perhaps your family might have owned that might be in, a, in an organization institution and you wanna see if you can find if there is one. And the third is, and this is the connection to Yeshiva University Museum, is a museum or an organization institution that has wimples and wants to know more about the wimples that they have. So uh, please give me one moment while I see if I can open this. Um, uh, please give me uh, just a moment. Uh, maybe one of my colleagues wants to to um, talk for just a moment um, while I'm seeing if I can get this squared away. Okay, uh, I just want to uh, remind you all that you can put your questions or comments for our uh, panelists today in the Q&A box at any time, and we will uh, try to get to as many as we can uh, after Karen, uh, after the uh, final presentation, uh, which will be uh, the next one after Karen. What did we do? Oh, we went to the file itself, right? Uh -huh. That was in. And they can hear us as we're talking. So sorry about this. Uh, no problem. Bonnie Dara, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but can you go into a little bit um, more detail about uh, what you and your team undertook uh, in the um, digitization project? What we did was uh, we 
took groups of binders, a few at a time, because since they are so long, it takes a while to unroll them and to shoot them. And uh, it was Gail Alderman who did most of this work. She would bring them down to the digital lab here at the center, and Jennifer would shoot them. And then another member of Jennifer's team would stitch together the digital images. Gail would bring the binders that had been worked on that day back to our textile storage area and re-roll them carefully and replace them in the climate control storage. Great. Um, just hold on, Bonnie Dara, for one more second, Karen. Let's see if you're back. Oh, okay. It looks like it's working. Thank you so much, Bonnie Dara, for that uh, more detailed, uh, you know, overview of that the process that you all undertook, so that we could have these beautiful uh, photos of these beautiful objects uh, to look at online. Karen, uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you so much. My screen looks very weird, but I presume you can just see my screen and we're good to go? Uh, I see your screen and also um, I can kind of see you in profile. Uh, Okay, so and let profile me profile on top of this the uh slides, which is a little weird. Now if I do that, you can't can you see it? Yeah, now it's just, just the slides. Yep. Super. Okay, great. Apologies for that. Um hang on one more second. I don't believe this. Um I am so sorry have so many issues and there we go. Um, so to begin with where you might find images of wimples that you would be interested in, the first one is of course books. Here is a uh, catalog from Congregation Manual, the city of New York. And there you see many of the wimples that they hold in their collections. The one that I like the most is the wimple of Nathan Strauss. That's Nathan, Isidore, and Oscar Strauss. You remember maybe Isidore is the most famous because he went down on the Titanic. But Nathan, uh, uh, Netanya in Israel is named for Nathan Strauss. And uh, yeah, so um, his Wimple is in the collection of Temple Emmanuel. Another set of Wimples, an extensive collection, is in the Jewish Museum in Prague, and they published a book about their collection uh, some years ago. And what I love about this is there's really a great deal of detail about the various Wimples in the collection. Many of them have the town where the uh, Wimples were found or came from. So if you have Czech ancestry, you know the name of the town where your family came from, you may be able to identify an ancestor to whom this wimple once belonged because of the birth date or the name, for example, even though there's no uh, surname involved. Now, other archival holdings would include even Leo Beck Institute, which you can get to our catalog online, lbi.org. One of the wimples in the collection is this really fabulous Bloch wimple. It's wonderful for genealogists, for example, because it it has the uh, images of the houses that the family had lived in and also the names, the places where they lived and has really beautiful illustrations on it, giving great texture to the lives of the ancestors who are memorialized in this textile. Now, my work with Yeshiva University Museum from some years ago happened when the museum was uh, looking into its collection and wanted to see if, if the names on the wimples could be matched to people to find out more about them. So the first step I took uh, to find this was to put on jewishgen.org, on the discussion group, the information that we had, which included, for example, uh, Court uh, Solomon, Solomon uh, born January 15th, 1915. This was in a collection that Bonnie Dara had mentioned from Shari Hatikva in Washington Heights, mostly German Jewish place. And in this particular case, uh, Kurt Solomon's name actually appeared in English on the wimple, but you can also see that there is um, 
is material online. This is actually from Ancestry, where the same birth date for Kurt Solomon uh, is included. And I just thought what was a little hilarious about this draft registration was that his employer was unexcelled laundry system. I don't really know what that means, but I looked it up and it was not really Googleable with that name. I didn't look carefully, but um, I'm just saying. So I was able to find out um, more about this Kurt Solomon. Uh, we knew that he had come from a place called Kirschberg. And once confirming that the Kirschberg that he came from was in the Palatinet, I was able to uh, work together with a local historian who knew not only the story of Kurt Solomon, but also about the maker of the Wimple. And the reason that that was important was because this local historian noted that the Wimple um, was dedicated two years after the birth of Kurt Solomon. It was from 1917. And he suggested that it was a very small local community. And he had actually known that Wilhelm Buchheim had been a soldier in the First World War and probably the only Wimple in the area, uh, uh, sorry, the only mole in the area. And so they did not want to entrust this job to someone else. So he waited until uh, Buchheim had, um, the, the mole himself had, had returned. Uh, Christoph Pisa is like one of many uh, local historians in many different towns in, in Germany. And he is the recipient of an Obermeier Award uh, in 2022, uh, honoring uh, local people who uh, restore the history of Jews in the towns that they they lived. Another uh, um, Wimble that we were quite successful in tracing is that of a court Ludwig Rothschild of Heldenbergen. Heldenbergen is a town in Hessen, not far from Frankfurt, of course. And also note this one has in English uh, his name and the town and the um, date of his birth. So I again put an inquiry on the Jewish Gen discussion group, and lo and behold, heard from uh, someone who was uh, Kurt's fifth cousin once removed, who was able to give an entire family history of the Rothschild family from this area. So already we had a great deal of information, but there was something very moving uh, because we were able to also I contact and identify two of the closer cousins in the United States uh, who were very happy to know that the Wimple was still in existence. And one said that his own Wimple had been shipped to the United States in a lift in a um, some sort of a case that was to have been delivered into the, to the family in the United States, which was lost and probably stolen en route. So his was was no longer found, but he was very happy to know that the cousins was there. Uh, and the third place that we found information uh, was this court Ludwig, uh, for court Ludwig Rothschild was uh, in the Leo Beck Institute itself. There is a book about Heldenbergen that had been written by a local historian in the area. And she had a photo, the little child in the photo is this court, uh, and sadly, um, he was murdered in the Holocaust along with his entire family. And there's there's really uh, a great sadness about the Wimple being supposed to be with this child to adulthood, to the chupa, to Torah, to marriage, um, and of course, his life was cut tragically short. Now, uh, in my work at Leo Beck Institute, I've also gotten numerous other inquiries about Wimples. Uh, here's one who is from a woman who is just simply searching to find out if there was a Wimple for her brother. This was uh, in uh, reference to a, another synagogue in, in the Washington Heights area that had closed, and there may have been a Wimple left in their collection. And here's another one from a museum that had a collection from the J uh, Jewish Cultural Reconstruction. And they were looking to see if we might have more information, which we were able to provide, uh, which we found someone from that town who had done research and could help the museum. Now, I wanna uh, talk about three more Wimples. When an announcement about this talk came out, I received a message from uh, Werner Frank, 
a, a wonderful uh, historian who uh, Dr. Mecklenburg referred to as really our Werner Frank. He's a, a good friend to many genealogists and historians for his insightful work. And he wrote me a story about his own Wimple that he had thought had uh, was no longer in existence, but he was born in 1929. He would have had his bar mitzvah uh, in, in 1932, if my math is approximately correct, in a town called Eppingen. And he never knew what happened to it, but apparently it had successfully been brought in a lift to the United States by the family that had taken it from the synagogue to rescue it at the very last minute. And Werner Frank said he really had not thought about it, that his bar mitzvah, where it would have been wrapped on the Torah for that occasion, would have been the last bar mitzvah in the town prior to the Holocaust. So therefore, when the, the um, Torah was shipped, the wimple on it also came to the United States. And he was asked if he wanted it returned, uh, which, of course, he did. And this tradition which is not so very often followed in the United States or these days, was replicated uh, in Werner Frank's family when his wife, Phoebe, actually made a new uh, wimple for their grandson's um, uh, birth uh, some years uh, later for his uh, Brit Milah. The second to last one uh, I want to talk to you about is uh, I found in a New York Times article from just about 10 days ago, uh, a researcher who spent his has spent his life trying to get some of the family's um, objects and history restituted to him. Uh, it's a, If you haven't seen this article, I would encourage you to take a look. Among the items he had restituted to him uh, was from the Göttingen City Museum, and it was a wimple from the museum which he got back. It had uh, wrapped his great-grandfather uh, some generations ago. And what's really interesting about this is this was also used specifically for a descendant of uh, this gentleman, Hayden, but it was uh, for a girl, which is certainly a very uh, current understanding of the um, giving from generation to generation. Obviously, she didn't have a Brit Milah, but in fact, it was at her naming ceremony where this was handed down. So it really is a contemporary uh, reminiscence of this uh, older um, custom. But finally, just to tell you, of course, it couldn't be a Karen Franklin special unless it had something about my own family. And this is a, a document which I had found in the Hessische Hauptstadt's Archiv. Uh, the archive in Hessen some decades ago was a family history about my ancestors, great, 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 whatever it was. And in this little text, it identifies that the exact age, exact birth date of this ancestor was known because of his wimple. Now, whether this wimple still exists, I have no idea. But of course, as we all know, unless it's a rabbinic family, sometimes it's very difficult to identify an exact birth date in the 1700s. It will say on the tombstone that you know they're 86 years old or something like this, and you can estimate. But here we have, in fact, the exact birth date of my ancestor. So with that, um, let me see. Here I am. Uh, along with my other esteemed colleagues to answer any questions you might have. Oh, actually, Karen, before we get to that, I just have a few more slides to, to show. Oh, and oh, sorry. That, Never mind. That's okay. That's okay. We'll get to the, we'll get to the Q&A very shortly. Um, okay. All right. I'm going to just share my screen. Okay. Uh, if there are no issues with the screen, then that's fine. I will go ahead. I'll just someone button if you're not seeing this properly. 
Okay, so I'm just going to spend uh, a several minutes talking about how you can research uh, wimples, whether it's uh, a wimple in your own family or you're doing research from uh, some uh, based on some museum collection. Uh, in any case, there are uh, some important steps uh, that will that I will go over that I will hopefully make the process easier for you. Uh, okay. So first of all, I just want to reiterate that the Center for Jewish History is a uh, umbrella organization for five in-house partner organizations. Uh, the five listed here, we already heard from uh, uh, a staff member from the Leo Beck Institute and another from the Yeshiva University Museum, but this is all the also the building which houses the collections of the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, and the Yivo Institute for Jewish Research. And on top of that, in this one building, there are museum galleries, a library reading room, genealogy center, and multiple event spaces. We also have one central catalog where you can search across the collections of all five partners. Uh, that is search.cgh.org. You can search from home. Uh, and I do encourage you to play around with it if you have not before. Uh, so a few uh, strategies that you may want to consider is to use diff you may need to search different terms uh, to find exactly what you're looking for. Uh, so for example, I searched both wimples as well as uh, the term Torah binders. And as you can see, it came up with different numbers of results. So there may be, there's, there's certainly a lot of overlap between those two, but there are also obviously others that are just uh, described as Torah binders without without the word wimples. Um, and when you uh, get to, uh, when you search, when you click search, you'll get to a list of, you know, potential or matching uh, items that might be of interest to you. Um, so this sort of looks like what you see on the right side of your screen. And you will also see this menu uh, on the side, which will allow you to further uh, refine your results. So for example, if you wanted to only see what's available online, you could click on that. Uh, if you wanted to limit it to a specific uh, partner collection, you can do that as well. And as well as uh, limiting it by material type. And I just want to specify that in this case of visual materials, uh, those that's referring to those photos of the individual wimples that both uh, Bonnie Dara and uh, Karen Franklin showed um, examples of earlier. So uh, again, to specifically, if you were interested in uh, looking through the Yeshiva University Museum's uh, Wimples project, all of those digitized, uh, I all of those different, uh, different digitized Wimples, you could uh, select the uh, Yeshiva University Museum and visual materials from that menu on the side. And just out of curiosity, I sorted the uh, results by date from the oldest, uh, oldest first. Um, and when you click into one of those records, in this case, I just clicked on the title of the first one, uh, you will see uh, a more detailed description of that item. I just want to point out that it, specifically within the uh, Yeshiva, Yeshiva University's Museum's Wimples project, uh, you will those that were digitized for the Wimples project, 
you will notice that in the description, it also uh, has the Hebrew inscription uh, written out in Hebrew letters and also uh, underneath that, a translated inscription in English. Uh, so uh, very, uh, of course, very makes it even more accessible to those of us who don't read Hebrew. Uh, and finally, uh, you would be able to click on uh, online access, that link there, which will bring you to the photo of the actual object. Um, Karen mentioned briefly uh, about uh, books being uh, an important tool for uh, researching further into the history of specific uh, wimples. Uh, and so we have several books here uh, within both uh, the Yeshiva University Museum and Leo Beck Institute uh, collections that are essentially uh, published by several different museums that hold large collections of wimples. Uh, and so you can get a sense of sort of the breadth of wimples uh, in these different collections. And uh, also, you know, just more information about how they were uh, created and how they, uh, you know, the different styles that were used and all that sort of thing, uh, background information on this particular tradition. Uh, and finally, I want to mention that there is one reading room here at the Center for Jewish History, uh, pictured here, where you can view the materials from all partner collections. Um, the reading room is open Monday through Thursday from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, we do highly recommend that you make an appointment. However, we are allowing people to come in without appointments. We just can't guarantee that, there, that you will receive same-day service if you do not have an advanced appointment. Uh, that being said, uh, the vast majority of people who have come in uh, without an appointment have been able to see uh, the materials that they would uh, that they uh, wanted to see on the same day. And if you plan on visiting in person uh, to see, uh, in particular, in this case, I'm referring to the books uh, that I mentioned, which are not available online you would have first have to register for a research account at libraryservices.cjh.org, um, which you can also get to just by going to our catalog page and clicking on the link. Um, so you would just, uh, you would get to a login page like this, click on first time users, and the rest of, the pro of that process should be pretty self-explanatory. Once you submit your registration form, uh, you will then go back to the catalog to request the particular book that you would like to see. Uh, so this is just one example. Um, we're back to the catalog record for this particular item. You would click on get it on the side here, and that would bring you to this section here where you would click request item. Um, of course, I don't expect you all to memorize this. I just want to give you a little taste of what the process looks like, uh, but we're happy to help you uh, whenever you come in person. And if you can't visit us in person, you still have uh, an option to be able to access uh, images of these materials. Um, and I'm now referring to, again, things that you cannot see online. Uh, so uh, not all of, so I'm not talking about those uh, wimples that were uh, digitized by Shiva University Museum. Those are already all uh, available online. But in this case, specifically, if you were interested in, uh, uh, let's say, rec uh, receiving copies of a portion of a book, we can uh, do that for you. 
Um, it is sort of a complicated process though. So I do recommend that you email our reading room at inquiries at cgh.org uh, and they will send you um, detailed instructions on how to order those copies. Um, just uh, a little bit about our fee structure. Uh, the you will uh, you will always receive a cost estimate, um, which you will need to approve before your request is even uh, is is even be uh, before we even begin to fulfill your request. And I also want to mention, since I think all of the books that I found related to Wimples were published after 1924. They are still in copyright, and therefore uh, we can only scan up to a third of uh, those books. And for an idea of turnaround time, it, it really varies uh, based on a lot of different factors. Um, sometimes if it's a very small amount of uh, copies, it, it may you know just be a, a couple of days. Um, but depending on the size of your order and uh, other factors uh, that are uh, mostly beyond our control, it can take up to two months. Um, okay, so I will stop there. And we still have a good 20 minutes to discuss. Uh, can everyone please turn your camera and uh, Mike's back on. Thank you. So first of all, did anyone want to add anything to what I just uh, said now? If I didn't represent any of your institutions accurately. You represented Yeshiva University Museum perfectly accurately, but I just would like to highlight the fact that not all Torah binders are wimples. Oh, yes. The wimples are this particular German tradition made in honor of the birth of a boy. And something like uh, an Italian Torah binder would have been embroidered by a woman frequently and has nothing to do with a boy or birth or anything like that. Oh, OK. Thank you. Um. Let's see. So I will start with actually uh, first a question from our audience. Um, uh, um, if uh, I just want to say if any of the speakers need to leave early, that's totally fine. Um, we will continue with whoever's left. Um, so first of all, question for any of you um, to, uh, to chime in. Who determined what was included in a wimple? And uh, the second part of that question, were there standard images or subjects to choose from? Does anyone want to take that on? I thought Cassia just said she would like to. Oh. Let's see. But uh, I would imagine like any other artwork, such as the Ketuba, this would have been discussed by the family and the artist if they were hiring an artist. In the 70s, there were a lot of people, uh, the whole Jewish catalog, I believe, had suggestions for creating wimples and recreating this, this process. And if people are doing it themselves, obviously they can choose themselves. And the frequent images include uh, a Torah, a couple under the marriage canopy. And other than that, they could vary. Yeah, so uh, I have a question sort of building on that. Um, it seems like there's a lot of uh, variety in what symbols people chose, how uh, how they were manufactured, um, the different styles of text and, and decorations. Uh, were there any um, specific regional traditions or is it just like up to each individual's family's, uh, you know, uh, preferences, ideas, et cetera? It's too bad Felicitas just stepped away because there was definitely 
an Alsatian tradition. Mm -hmm. And I'm not learned enough about that tradition to be able to address it. Okay. But they would, among other things, have Alsatian patriotic motifs. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Do you have any... Um, oh, hi, Felicitas. Uh, sorry that you just uh, missed the question, but I will re I will ask it again, see if you have anything to add. Um, were there regional differences in the manufacturing or the styles of wimples? Uh, you're on mute still. You're still muted. Um, let me see if I can unmute you. There were, I mean, oh. there were differences <laughs> You know, the typical differences between North and South, because we are always uh, mainly talking about wimples coming from uh, from uh, from uh, I'm sorry, I'm distracted from the Alemannic region. But um, as we saw in, in what you showed us from, from that, that there were wimples stemming from Göttingen, and um, uh, which is uh, not uh, the Alemannic region. And then this tradition was migrated to the north, to uh, Lower Saxonia, to the region of Berlin, and finally to Denmark. So, and, um, you know, I mean, the text I would say uh, was always the same, and also the depiction. I mean, what was the illustrate? What was illustrated was all also always the same. Like Bodhidharma said, you know, you uh, illustrated what um, that the boy might be brought to the Torah and then to the Chupa and then to the good deeds. Um, so the subjects were the same, but the styles differed really. Um, on the one hand, they always reflected the time in which they were produced, uh, like we saw this with the Eschwege uh, 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 wimples, which are so, so American. <laughs> so, and uh, others from the Alsace, which became so French in a way, or whatsoever, or the Czech ones became really Bohemian or Moravian in 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 yeah. in the way um, the illustrations uh, were carried out in detail, but the the text was more or less always the same, um, and the I would say the way certain thing certain illustrations reflected the surroundings, that was different. So for example, a wimper from Alsace, like a manuscript from Alsace, reflects much more the rural surrounding than uh, does a wimper from, let's say, Augsburg or Ulm or any other uh, smaller or bigger city in the Bodensee region, in the in the Lake Constance region, uh, so it so this is you can really see that or in the uh, on the wimples of Copenhagen from which stem from Copenhagen, you often see a ship because there was the sea in front of you, and and this was reflected in 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 the style on the one hand of the manuscripts and on the one ha other hand also of the wimples. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, um, I'm really thrilled to hear about, uh, about all of those examples and uh, thank you for clarifying. Um, so uh, there's a question for both uh, Karen and Bonnie Dara. Um, if someone uh, has a, wimple in their, uh, at home or uh, in, among their relatives, and they're thinking about uh, 
potentially uh, donating it to an institution. Um, can you comment on whether your institutions are, are still accepting donations of wimples and how someone would go about, um, you know, initiating that process? We would definitely be interested in such a thing. We would also just be interested to see it if somebody would like to share pictures of it, even if they aren't ready to donate it yet. And if somebody is interested in either, please get in touch with me. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just to follow up, LBI does not have the resources for storing textiles that Yeshiva University Museum has. So that would probably be a more likely uh, place to donate. Thank you. Um, and actually, that sort of brings me to a more practical question that came up. Um, so uh, circumcision would have produced blood, uh, Myrna writes. How was the cloth treated? Do you have any sense of, of, of what happened, uh, you know, historically? I would presume that they took care of the blood just as they would take care of blood from any other accident or cut or scrape. Mm -hmm. And the individual housewife or the servants would know how to deal with it. Yeah. And so I'm sorry, we don't have a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> do you still see traces of, of blood on any of the wimples in your collection? Yes. Yes, but the question is when they acquired that stain. Ah, uh, that's a good point. We don't know if it's necessarily at that particular ceremony. Yeah. Um, actually, that brings me to another question that I have for you, Bonnie Dara. Um, uh, let's see. What when you have uh, acquired wimples in the past, what sorts of conservation measures are usually taken um, before it's, uh, let's say, ready for uh, storage or even after, you know, after you store it, what kinds of conservation treatments go on over time? We have a textile team who are professionals and we would get the piece in. They would examine it carefully. They will write up a written report. This is what it is. This is its measurement. This is how it is made. It's embroidered. It's painted. It's both dimensions, photographing bit by bit so that we have a record of that as well. They, depending on how fragile it is, what they have done in the past, if something is very sturdy, is we have a vacuum with a HEPA filter with adjustable speeds, and it will be put on its lowest stuck speed and used through a screen, which would further reduce the amount of stress. But if it is, let's say, something that is painted that the paint is already flaking or something that is embroidered and the embroidery threads are already starting to pull, they might decide not to do that. The piece will then be wrapped either face in or face out, depending on how it's made, around a acid-free core roller, like a toilet paper roller, if you'll pardon me. <laughs> and But we do not use those. Those are not acid-free. And interleaved with acid-free tissue paper. It would then be have a final layer of tissue paper on which somebody would have written the inventory number of the item so that it can be retrieved easily. Okay. And um, it is hung in a special cabinet so that there is no pressure on the decoration itself. The cabinet has tubes from which these tubes are suspended. Oh, wow. And then it's it does not sit on a shelf. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, well, 
what else would I like to ask? Let's see. I think we have some more questions from the audience. Uh, somebody asked about the uh, wimples from Italy. Uh, Bonnie Dara, you were talking about Torah binders, right? Not not wimples, right? The Italian are usually Torah binders, not wimples. But it could there could very well have been a German family living in Italy who had a wimple made for a child. That's interesting. Um, oh, somebody asked, were the wimples made before the birth or after? They would have both? To have been made after because they have the date of birth of the child usually. Oh, right. The Hebrew and or the secular. Mm -hmm. So they had, and as you mentioned, they had, uh, they would present these to the synagogues when the child was one to three years old, right? So they had, they certainly had some time to make them, right? Yes. Yes, it was customary. And, you know, there are a number of uh, depictions of this, for example, of this uh, minhag to present the wimple when the boy was brought uh, to the synagogue for the first time uh, by his father, mainly. So it was called the Mappe Schule Tragen, which is, so the shul was is the, is the name for the Yiddish, uh, for the synagogue and the Mappe, the Yiddish for the Mappa, for the Wimple. Um, so it was, clearly a German minhag and you can look at you can uh, look up illustrations for example one of the most famous ones is by uh, by Oppenheim who uh, did this this whole uh, I mean who depicted uh, a whole series of uh, of uh, German especially German Jewish customs in the middle of the 19th century in Frankfurt so um and and many people wrote about it so like Joseph Gutmann was one of the uh, i think would be one of the most famous people who wrote about this minhag about this right so yeah okay i have a couple of questions about the sort of life cycle of the of an individual wimple itself i so i understand it was um uh, typically brought to a, uh, the family synagogue where it would be stored and taken out uh, uh, on special occasions such as the boy's bar mitzvah and maybe even uh, up to his his marriage, his wedding ceremony. Um, what would typically happen to the wimple after that, after let's say the, the last important uh, event in which it would be used? If I may answer this question, I think there is not one answer to that. I think it depends very, very much of the people involved, of the community, of um, and also of the historical consciousness of that specific or family mm -hmm. or person, individual person or community. I uh, worked on a couple of wimples uh, at the uh, Historical Museum in Braunschweig, in Brunswick. As I told you, I, I, I uh, showed the wimple of Israel Jacobson, one of the most famous, I mean, uh, people of reform, uh, of the reform movement. And his wimple, and this might be a good example, came to that specific museum because it was held in uh, the first in the in his school in his famous school in Sesen, but then was transferred to the Samson Schule. Samson was his relative in Wolfenbüttel, which is near Braunschweig and the city in which uh, Lessing lived and worked. And in this this Samson school, which was the second reform school. In, in Germany, 
was closed down in the 1920s. And one of the his descendants who was in the curatorium in the in the uh, in the board so to speak was Helene Magnus who was the wife <laughs> again of um of uh, of fa the famous graphic Ephraim Moses Lillian oh wow. she i mean took care that the remnants of this famous Samson school did not get lost, but were transferred to Braunschweig, to the historical museum, to oh. be kept there. And that's the reason why they why this famous or this important wimple, this important piece of German Jewish history is there. So um and other 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 wimples from that region were given to that museum because this museum had installed in 19, in 19 I mean directly after World War one they had transferred a, a synagogue from a tiny village in Lower Saxonia because the then director found it was such a great example for German Baroque that they transferred the interior after the Jewish community had been dissolved. I mean, it had vanished because it was too tiny to this museum. And then people thought, okay, if they took in the interior of the former synagogue, they would also take in other Jewish material culture, which was the fact. And as such, a lot of, you know, communities which were small communities, you never heard the name of Gandersheim. The community, the synagogues were dissolved. The last people left um, around World War I or a bit later, and then they did not know what to do. And the last one who closed the door, so to speak, um, took the took what was in the Torah Ark or in the Geniza and donated it or asked the museum to take this in as German Jewish heritage. Well, it's important that there's some people that there were and continue to be people who are preservation minded and, and interested in the, um, you know keeping that history. Uh, alive and accessible to people uh, for research or uh, even just to sort of um, uh, reconnect with uh, a part of your uh, your heritage or history. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that in mind, I want to thank both of you so much for your wonderful um, participation today, both in your presentations and in answering uh, questions from myself and the audience. Um, I greatly appreciate both of your expertise in your different areas and uh, and sharing that with us, I think has been really, uh, has been really a gift to all of us today. Um, and one on one final note, uh, Felicitas, do you have um, a method of, uh, contact that you would like people to to use to get if they have questions for you i mean i'm happy to that you share my email okay okay so i will put my uh i will put the email in the chat box again oh actually i don't think i ever did uh, my apologies um that gi at tgh.org is the email of the Genealogy Institute. If you email me uh, asking, or sorry, if you email that uh, uh, gi at cgh.org asking for uh, contact information for any of our speakers today, we will uh, happily uh, provide that or connect you to the appropriate person. Um, so thank you again. I thank you all for joining us and I look forward to seeing you at our next program. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.